Welcome to 101 East. I'm Steve Chow. The world's coral reefs are in trouble. 75% are now at serious risk of dying. For millions of years, they've given life to the oceans, providing food and shelter to all who inhabit them. But humans have polluted, causing the climate to change, putting marine life at risk. Destructive fishing methods are also laying bare much of the world's coral reefs. This week, we're in Indonesia, in the heart of what's known as the Coral Triangle, to witness the frontline fight to save the world's oceans. For centuries, these bright blue waters have been home to Hamadine's family. They live in one of the most remote corners of Indonesia, in an area scientists believe could hold the secret to saving the world's coral reefs. Globally, reefs are dying off. But here, healthy coral carpets the seafloor. For Hamadine, the vibrant life around that coral sustains him and his family. When I'm down in the water, I feel so much joy because I'm catching fish and providing for my family. If we respect the oceans, they will keep providing for our daily needs. The tribe Hamadine belongs to does not believe in mass fishing. They take only what they need. And while their methods are slow, Hamadine is proud he's keeping an ancient tradition of conservation alive. When I first began to spearfish, I was always moving and aiming everywhere. I eventually learned you need to steady your hands to get a good shot. And only then will you hit the fish in the right place. Hamadine believes magical powers preserve and protect these shoals. Researchers have found fossils of coral dating back millions of years to the Ice Age. At the time, reefs globally were also facing a major die-off. When temperatures warmed, scientists believe it was from here the planet's reefs were reborn. Hamadin lives in a stretch of islands in Indonesia known as Banda. They lie in the heart of the Coral Triangle a six million square kilometer area in the Western Pacific that scientists classify as the most biodiverse marine environment on the planet. More than 75% of the world's coral species are found here, along with 3,000 different species of fish. It's little wonder the triangle is considered the Amazon jungle of the ocean. But what first drew explorers to this pristine area wasn't the underwater life. It was spices, like nutmeg and cinnamon. These were so valuable, wars were fought to gain control of the spice trade. Forts belonging to the Dutch and British still dot the landscape. The Banda Islands were once traded for what is today one of the most expensive pieces of real estate on the planet. The story goes that back in the 17th century, the British Empire traded one of these spice islands for the island of Manhattan, which is present-day New York City. What few understood at the time was that the true value was under the water. The incredible world below the surface is attracting far more attention today. With the majority of coral reefs dying around the globe from warmer water temperatures, pollution, and human activity, Scientists and conservationists are in a race to learn the secrets of what keeps coral here alive. Marine biology expert Martin Welly leads a team that hopes to unlock clues as to why this area seems relatively unaffected by climate change. The answers, he says, could save the planet's marine life. The coral reef is the home for fish, the nursery ground for fish, feeding ground for fish. If you, imagine, if you have imagination, like in, you in the middle of desert, and then there is a shelter, of course people would like to go to that uh, shelter. The coral reef like shelter in the desert. Mm -hmm. 
Martin and his team record every species they see, from soft corals to hard ones. Martin's research has taken him around the world. He's documented how the warming of the oceans by just a few degrees has bleached the life out of entire reefs. Here in the Triangle, he believes, lies some of the secrets to the coral survival. Strong currents and deep cold water which neutralize the effects of climate change. The Banda Sea is famous with deep sea and then very dynamic currents and with the water from the bottom coming up. That's always provide uh, fresh water oxygen for the, the coral itself. That's why the, the coral is uh, uh, very well growing in this area. Just how quickly the coral here grows is something Martin is keen to show me. He takes me to another reef, which lies in the shadow of a now dormant volcano. So Martin, what's the history of this place? Gunung Api Mountains was erupted in 1998 and then broke the lava going down to the sea. And then all coral reef around this area is damaging. Normally, Martin says, when natural disasters hit, it takes reefs several decades to recover. But underwater, we find little evidence of destruction. The coral is thick and teeming with life. We find a cuttlefish laying eggs. Martin shows me a piece of coral four meters in circumference. He says it would normally take 50 years for coral to grow to this size. This has taken just 15. By studying ocean currents, Martin and his researchers have also learned reefs in the Triangle act like breeding grounds, with tides carrying newborn coral to other parts of the Pacific and beyond. What does this area do for the rest of the world? Yeah, you can see that the coral is growing very fast after eruption of the mountain. This means this area is very healthy and then can become like a bang for the coral reef, distribute the baby coral around the world. Above the water, Martin and his team are fighting a growing threat to the coral survival, overfishing. They record the GPS coordinates of every boat they find. Each fisherman is interviewed on the size of his catch. In order to track how current fishing methods are impacting the Triangle's reefs. Extractive fishing and overfishing still happen in this country. And then also illegal fishing. There's many fishermen from outsider come to Indonesian water and then catch fish. They need more uh, patrons and surveillance monitoring. Over the past decade, Martin has helped convince the Indonesian government to create marine parks, which now protect 150,000 square kilometers of ocean. But he says the problem is there aren't enough officers and resources to enforce the no fishing rules. If they pass a boat, sometimes there is no fuel to the petrol. They have boat and fuel, but how about the skill of the people? The training for the people. We train the people, they need uh, equipment. As Martin and his crew continue their monitoring, we head to a reef close by. One of the most destructive forms of fishing uses explosives. It's a practice that's banned, but we're told still continues. Our dive guide here has just told us that he's found a stretch of coral that was likely damaged by a fisherman who dropped dynamite into the water. We're gonna go in for a quick look. The remains of a fishing net offer the first sign that something is wrong. Just below it, we come across a crater of destruction. It's a wasteland. Almost all the coral here is dead. In many cases, all that's left are brittle, powdery fragments. Our dive guide tells me he's seen this before. This is the work of dynamite fishing. We've been to so many pristine areas around here, and we know the beauty of this place. So when we see the amount of destruction here, 
it's really heartbreaking. Martin sees his mission to preserve reefs as a race against time. He's dedicated his life to protecting what he considers the last refuge of the world's coral. At stake, he says, is the livelihood of millions of people. More than 120 million people depend on the coral reef and marine resources in this area. If you not really take care and protect this uh, coral reef and marine resources in this coral triangle area, 120 million people will lose their income, which lose their resources. He estimates humankind understands less than 2% of how the ocean's unique life survives. And he fears time in the Coral Triangle is now running out, as human activity increasingly encroaches on this remote part of the world. Can you imagine if this area is broken and then disappear? We will lose uh, the, the opportunity to study this, this area. If your coral reef disappears, then fish also will disappear from that area. That's why very, very important to protect the hope of fish like coral reef. Fortunately, Martin and his team are not alone in their fight. From Banda, we travel more than a thousand kilometers northwest to Manado, a place known as a diving mecca. It's here I meet up with a British explorer who's designed some incredible tools for underwater research. With them, he's undertaking an ambitious mission. By equipping marine scientists with special cameras, Richard Beavers plans to quickly capture snapshots of the ocean floor. Well, traditionally, um, surveys were very, very time consuming and very expensive to carry out. So you'd send a diver and they'd take a camera and they'd point it down, you'd have a square showing a square meter and you'd take a photograph. So you could do maybe 50 of these in a single dive. Um, whereas we've invented a technology that takes 360 degree imagery um, every three seconds as we're going along for two kilometers in a dive. Each camera also records the exact GPS coordinates for future reference. And that's what we've been doing over the last two years. We've collected over a million images, which is an accurate record which we can revisit, go back to those same GPS locations and see what change has happened. Richard says his new method of research is 30 times faster than traditional underwater mapping. It's an immense step forward in the, the speed and the efficiency at which we can do surveying. And then we also have got technology that can use image recognition um, to be able to identify the, the different species in the images. Joining him on his dive today is Jacqueline Lycoon, a marine biology student. Two, four. The kit he's brought for her is a stripped-down model made for local communities to use. You take a shot, then turn the camera, and take another shot. Later, the photographs will be stitched together to provide a 360-degree view of the reef. Within the coral triangle, they've captured images of some of the sea's most elegant creatures. We've lost about 40% of corals in the last 30 years alone. And a lot of this is going um, really unnoticed. So the mission for the Captain Seaview survey really is to document this change and make sure everyone is aware of what's going on. Funded by a British insurance company called Catlin, survey teams have already been to the Galapagos Islands, documenting schools of fish and playful sea lions. On Australia's Great Barrier Reef, a diving robot moved into uncharted territory by carrying out the first ever mapping of deep water coral. There we discovered some of the deepest ever corals um, on the Great Barrier Reef at 125 metres and several new species. And it really goes to show how little we know about coral reefs. Jacqueline turns out to be a fast learner and pretty soon she's photographing images of the coral by herself on the reefs she grew up swimming around. So this is the program. 
So once you've loaded these... Back on land, Richard shows her how to stitch together the photographs and then create the 3D panoramic images. Catlin has also joined forces with internet giant Google, and the images can be viewed online as an underwater version of Street View. What we want to do is, is to be able to take everyone virtually diving. So let anybody go and, and see these environments for themselves. And with our photography, we can go into an environment and take the 360 images, which will allow them to do just that. Richard says the next step is to build software to allow the public to help catalog species of coral and fish to better monitor the health of reefs. It's critical people are aware of what's happening underwater. One of the best ways is to include citizen science into a project like this. So what we're developing is technology that allows people to analyse the images and look for um, bits of information that the computers can't currently detect. Our eyes are so much better and our brains are so much better at detecting certain things, like being able to spot a fish from various different angles. So this is our camera underwater. Tonight, Richard and Jacqueline are showing these images to a nearby village. For many here, it's the first time they've seen what life is like underwater. It is the best, best reef I have ever seen. The images they show prove to be a hit. What is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a real joy to be able to go into a community and show images that people can be proud of. So being able to reveal a location that's on people's doorsteps that they really haven't seen before um, is a magical experience. In America again. To give people and here a better understanding, and this is the before. Richard shows pictures of once healthy reefs off the coast of Florida. And this is the after. Reefs that are now devastated by climate change and human activity. For Jacqueline, it's a proud moment to be able to share some of her own panoramic shots. I hope communities can learn and work together with experts to protect the coral reefs around here so that future generations will be able to see the underwater life as we see it now. The closest most Indonesians get to the sea is to fish markets like this one in Manado City. Every day, boats bring in large hauls to meet a growing demand for seafood. Coastal cities like Manado are booming, but development comes at a cost. Waters are increasingly polluted and nearby reefs destroyed. But a team of local divers are hoping to reverse that trend. Over the past few years, they've given up diving in more pristine spots and instead focus their attention on Monado's harbor. In its murky waters, they're bringing reefs back to life. They take pieces of coral from healthy areas and attach them to artificial structures. The hope is they'll begin multiplying. There are signs life is returning. Obviously, it is still very early to see the big environment impact. But for sure, there is a certain excitement for us, local divers, to see the rebirth and the growth of the coral that we plant. It is really amazing. The feeling is indescribable. The volunteer divers have so far built 12 artificial reefs. They include a row of around 40 old scooters, which offer the team a moment for some impromptu fun. Divers here say they know cleaning up the harbor is a big challenge. Much of the garbage from the area's beaches gets washed into the water, killing reef life. We are set to see damaged coral and garbage in the ocean. We are a small community. What we need is big and bold action from many people and many communities to save the coral reefs. We just hope to remind people of the increasing threat. Not far from the community of divers, we join Angelique Batuna a passionate diver that has devoted her life to protecting the area's reefs. But Angelique fears some of them are being destroyed by a mining company. 
open cut mining started here last year. What used to be green hills have been laid bare, causing runoff that's polluting the reef. And while Indonesia's Supreme Court has ruled the operation is illegal and should be shut down, local authorities have supported it, issuing the company permits to mine. Yes, this was a few months ago. It was, it was so bad. But it's what's happening under the water that concerns Angelique. The company has promised not to damage any reefs. Whether they're living up to their word is what we're here to find out. Local police protect the mine's interests, and from shore, they've already started watching our boat. Authorities, we're told, have been very aggressive in keeping divers away from their operations, so what we're going to do is we're going to dive in here, swim over as close as we can get to the jetty underwater. Under the surface, visibility is bad. It's all we can do to stay together. As for coral, there's hardly any to be found. The reef, or what used to be the reef, is covered in layers of thick silt. And even the patches of what's left are slowly choking. After only a few minutes, we surface. It's really bad. It's so dark. The visibility is totally zero. I didn't expect it to be this bad. How was the coral here before? It was really beautiful, healthy, reef, lots of colors, lots of fish. And then now, I mean, it's nothing. Last July, when villagers tried presenting the mine with a Supreme Court decision to shut down operations, they were stopped by police and mine supporters. Rocks were thrown, and a violent confrontation ensued. So the villagers brought the letter to the mining company and wanted to show it to them, like, look, we won already, so you have to get out from here. But then on the way there, they've been ambushed by other uh, people that's pro-mining. And so then chaos started to happen. With the mine supported by the provincial governor and police chief, Angelique worries that little can now be done. We contacted the mining company. Its lawyer turned down our request to interview the owner, but says they have a permit to mine and are therefore acting within the law. He also insists they've not damaged any reefs. About a kilometer away from the mine, we dive in again. Angelique wants to show me how the reef should look. Here we find the healthy and colorful beds of coral she described. I'm reminded of the beauty of this area, and also of beauty lost. Back in Banda, elders hold a special ceremony. They ask for blessings as they put in place a no fishing zone in the waters surrounding their village. It's a return to an ancient tradition Centuries ago, the tribe regularly banned fishing in parts of the ocean to allow fish populations to recover. Martin Welly calls these communities nature's frontline warriors. They leave him optimistic about the future, saying a united voice, however small, can save the reef. I have confidence that uh, if we do something, if we protect this coral reef, the coral reef will, will be still exist life resources of the people still exist. People still can eat for tomorrow and in, in the future. Throughout our time here, we've seen the Coral Triangle's magnificence. It is a sanctuary for marine life, like these endangered green turtles. And yet, outside threats are closing in. Humanity may be the Triangle's greatest enemy, but it may yet prove to be the area's ultimate savior, preserving and protecting this precious part of our planet.